Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. This is Kevin. And in this week's video, we're going to take a look at a new topic on the Cisco Encore exam. It's exam number 350-401. And the topic we're going to be addressing is VX lands, virtual extensible lands. We're going to see that we can have many more VX lands as compared to VLANs. And we're going to see that that VX LAN can actually span a layer three boundary. That's right. We can have a broadcast domain that's spanning a layer three boundary. Kind of amazing. And if you take a look at the Encore Blueprint, you'll see that you need to be able to explain VXLANs. No configuration necessary. And that's what we're going to accomplish in this video. I want to give you a solid understanding of the theory behind VXLANs. And as always, if you enjoy this video, please do me a favor, click that like button and subscribe so you don't miss any of our weekly content. Oh, and one other thing, if you enjoy this content, stay to the very end of the video because I'm going to be giving you some discount links where you can pick up our new CCNA Encore and a Narsi video training series. Now, let's jump into this video on VXLANs. With traditional Ethernet switches, we can support a little over 4,000 VLANs. The reason is the VLAN field is 12 bits long. That's going to give us just over 4,000 VLANs. But in today's networks where we might have a data center with lots of virtualization and the need to isolate several virtual machines from other virtual machines, we could easily run out of VLANs. Well, the great news is virtual extensible LANs or VX LANs can come to the rescue. They let us have over 16 million different identifiers instead of just 4,000. And the way VXLANs can do that is by encapsulating our layer two or even layer three traffic and adding a VXLAN network identifier. That's called a VNI. And this VNI field is 24 bits long. That's what gives us those 16 million plus VXLAN network identifiers. And those VXLANs can run over our existing physical network infrastructure. The existing physical network infrastructure is referred to as an underlay network. Here we see 12 different switches, and they're physically connected, as you see here. And this makes up the underlay network. But we could create logical tunnels between specific switches to create an entirely different topology. Here, we're using that same physical underlay network, but we're logically creating tunnels between select switches to create a totally different topology. And that's our overlay network. And we typically see this in data centers where we use a spine leaf design. We've got our nodes, like our servers, connecting to leaf switches. And those leaf switches, they interconnect by going through a spine. The spine switches allow any leaf switch to get to any other leaf switch in only a single hop. We just have to go through one spine switch because every leaf switch is connected to every spine switch. And the device that does our VXLAN encapsulation is called a virtual Ethernet module, or a VIM. And each VIM has an IP address. It could have more than one, but it's got at least one IP address that we're going to use to communicate over this routed network. And the IP address, it's assigned to a special interface called a VTEP, which stands for VXLAN Tunnel Endpoint. And each VTEP is associated with one or more VNIs. And VTEPs on different switches, they can temporarily bring up a tunnel and pass traffic between themselves. By the way, another benefit that VXLANs give us is that if we're sending traffic over a port channel where we've got multiple links making up a single logical link, instead of just using one link, the VXLAN switches know how to load balance that traffic across all of the different links in the port channel. That can dramatically reduce congestion in the data center. But an issue we have is what do we do with traffic for which we don't know the destination? I mean, on a regular switched infrastructure, a switch that doesn't know how to get to a destination, it's going to send out an ARP broadcast, perhaps. What about multicasts? What about unknown unicasts? What if we don't know where somebody lives? How do we get to them? Well, for that type of traffic, called bum traffic for broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast, we've got different approaches for handling that. But we're going to consider in this example using multicast. That's a very popular approach. What we can do is have these different VTEPs join a multicast group. Now, you might be wondering, uh, do we have to have a multicast group for each VNI? And no, we don't. We could have multiple VNIs belonging to the same multicast group because the VIMs themselves, they're going to look at that VNI identifier before sending the traffic out. And it can see, even though it received it over this multicast group, it's going to see that, oh yeah, this is destined for a different VNI. I don't send it out of this port. So it's totally fine to have multiple VNIs associated with the same multicast group. 
And let's walk through an example of how this is going to work. And the table you see on screen, that, that table is being maintained by Leaf Switch 1, Leaf SW1. And what we want to do here is we want Server 1 to communicate with Server 2. How do we do this? Well, Server 1 is going to send out an ARP broadcast because it knows it wants to get to 10.1.1.200, but it doesn't know the MAC address. So it sends out an ARP broadcast. And when that frame goes into Leaf Switch 1, it's going to make an entry in its table that says, hey, I just learned that the always MAC address lives off of port Ethernet 1 slash 1. And that switch also has a mapping table that says VLAN 10, to which Server 1 belongs, maps to VNI 100010. So now we have a VNI identifier, not just a VLAN identifier. And the way we're going to get to that is go out of Ethernet 1 slash 1. Well, we just sent broadcast traffic into this Leaf Switch 1. What's it going to do with that? Well, for that bum traffic, remember broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast? We're going to send that out to a multicast group that our other switches joined. And Leaf Switch 3 sees that because it's a member of that multicast group. We're pretending that the group number is 239.1.1.10. When it gets that broadcast ARP sent via multicast, it's going to flood it out all of its other ports. So it's going to go down to Server 2, and Server 2 says, yep, that's me. And it says, my MAC address is the old B's MAC address, and it goes back to Leaf Switch 3. And Switch 3 now knows that the 10.1.1.200 IP address with the all B's MAC address lives off of port Ethernet 1 slash 1. So it's going to respond to the other VTAP and say, hey, if you want to get to the all B's MAC address, come to me. Come to 192.168.1.33. That's my VTAP IP address. And it sends that information over to Leaf Switch 1. And Leaf Switch 1 is going to make an entry in its table that says, if I want to get to the all B's MAC address, which lives in VNI 100010, I want to go to a VTAP IP address of 192.168.1.33. And it's going to send the result of the all B's MAC address down to Server 1. So now when Server 1 wants to communicate with Server 2, it's going to send traffic to a destination IP address of 10.1.1.200, which by the way is in the same VLAN even though we're separated by a router. It's going to say, I want to go to that IP address with the old B's MAC address. And Leaf Switch 1 is going to say, according to my table, the old B's MAC address is available via VTAP 192.168.1.33. So Leaf Switch 1 is going to form a VTAP tunnel with Leaf Switch 3. It's going to send that traffic over there, and Leaf Switch 3 is going to send it out to Server 2. And that's a look at how VXLAN communication is going to be able to allow different devices that live on the same subnet, the same VLAN, to communicate with one another across a routed network. And it's very useful in a data center to have all those extra identifiers because, as we discussed, we could run out of VLANs, but we're probably not going to run out of VXLAN network identifiers. <music>